Hi, we're here from Argo and Tekton to talk about pushing the boundaries of what's possible on Kubernetes. So, who are we? Well, I'm Alex. I work at Intuit. Um, I specialize in um, Kubernetes and kind of OLTP stuff. And the lead engineer on Argo workflows, uh, Argo events, and Argo Labs Dataflow. And I like coffee and cycling. Ideally, a bike ride to a nice coffee shop is my kind of ideal Sunday. Yeah, uh, and I'm Jason Hall. I work at Red Hat. I've been involved with various developer tools for nigh on eight years now. I helped co-found the Tekton project, and I like pizza and sitting, and ideally sitting while eating pizza. Um, and what do we do? Um, like Alex said, he works on Argo Workflows. Argo Workflows is a general purpose workflow execution engine. Uh, steps in Argo run sequentially, and tasks in Argo run uh, in a DAG or a, day, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, it's built on Kubernetes, and it has a cute logo. Tekton is also a uh, continuous delivery focused workflow engine. Steps run sequentially, tasks run in a DAG. It's built on Kubernetes, and we also have a cute logo. They're friends. Why did we decide to build on Kubernetes? Um, when building a, a workflow service, there are two, well, there are a lot of problems. Uh, two of the biggest ones are node management, just managing the resources uh, to, that will be doing the work. And another is workload scheduling. So when a user's request comes in, I want to do this work, putting that on one of those nodes to do the work. Well, uh, if you are at KubeCon and know anything about Kubernetes, Kubernetes is very good at these. And so we, by building on Kubernetes, we don't ever have to, well, we do have to deal with it sometimes. But mainly, we just get to offload that uh, and make it Kubernetes' problem. Kubernetes also has a great, uh, a great resource in custom resources. Um, this lets us build flexible, extensible APIs um, inside the Kubernetes API server uh, and ecosystem. And we basically get RBAC for free. RBAC is another huge source of, of work if you don't have one already built for you, and Kubernetes built that for us. So we love it. And then there is the long tail of just community stuff. That's all of you. That's everyone outside. That's everyone watching, uh, watching all of this later. There's a huge community around Kubernetes um, that provide people to look out for the security of the platform and the performance of the platform and observing the platform and portability across different architectures and platforms. Um, client tooling for all of these things, and multi-tenancy concerns, and policy enforcement, and tons and tons and tons more. All of these things are things that if we didn't build on Kubernetes, we would have to build ourselves. Uh, and that would be a massive amount of work and largely pretty wasteful. And instead, we get to sit back and work on features while Kubernetes improves underneath us every day, thanks to all of you. However, Kubernetes was not really designed for this. It was more designed for long-running serving workloads, um, things like deployments and services and ingress, you know, the, the, the usual suspects. These things assume long-running pods. Well, we have relatively short-running pods. And they assume long-running containers, and we have fairly short-running containers. And they assume no control over the life cycle of the containers starting and stopping. They just sort of assume they run forever. Well, we need to start and stop these things a lot. Um, and they have no convention for passing data from one pod to another. Pods are, are pretty uh, isolated on purpose in the, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, well, we need to pass data between these things a lot. Um, so these are the, the sort of four main points we're gonna talk about, container lifecycle, starting and stopping, especially with regards to how sidecars are involved. Container uh, IPC, inter-process communication, talking between containers in a pod. Cross-pod communication, talking between pods in a workflow, and Custom resource proliferation, uh, which turns out to be a gigantic pain. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Alex to talk about container life cycles. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I just asked Jason if we could do something. Oh, I've completely forgotten. No, it's fine. OK. So put your hands up if you're an Argo Workflows user. Yeah, come on. And put your hands up if you're a Tekton user. Tekton user. Oh, Let the record yeah. reflect they had the exact same number of people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, the great thing about this talk is we get to talk about things that we have in common, which is brilliant. And one thing that we have in common is a container lifecycle. Now, both Argo and Tekton um, execute processes in graphs, in a directed acyclic graph, 
and that's um, not something that Kubernetes supports out of the box. And to make things more complicated, we actually can do things like modifying the graphs at runtime. So in the way that you specify in your pod spec what containers that you want to, to run in that pod, with our, our workflows and our graphs, we don't necessarily even know what the containers are gonna be when we start it. And you know, we have some nice simple ones, but we also have some pretty big graphs that we run, you know, 20, 30,000 pod graphs sometimes, and this is an example from the community. Uh, I, I can't even make out how many there are there. So what does Kubernetes provide out of the box for startup? Well, it kind of provides two options. The first option is init containers. It's pretty simple, but actually does fulfill some pretty you know, simple and useful use cases that allows you to start a, whole, a group of containers and they have to run to completion before you then run your main containers. And the other option is effectively run uh, one container in a pod and then you use the Kubernetes API to order the pod's execution, um, which is expensive because pod creation isn't actually that as cheap as you might imagine. And then the other thing we need to do for lifecycle management is ordered container shutdown. So what we want to do is shut down the containers in a specific controlled order, you know, stopping container B before stopping container A. And when they stop, when they're shut down, they need to be able to do some kind of graceful termination, you know, clean up, flushing their buffers, that kind of stuff. And that shutdown really needs to work with standard Kubernetes shutdown. And so the way that Kubernetes shuts down a pod is firstly you get a SIG term to the root process, then you get 30 seconds, configurable, yes I know, uh, followed by a SIG kill, a hard shutdown. So you need to work nicely with SIG term. So the way that we do this, the primary way that we do this is what we have termed the commandlet pattern, or which we termed Wednesday last week, that's why you've not heard of it. Um, but you probably know this better in Tekton as the en entry point rewriting or in Argo workflows as the emissary executor, which is very heavily influenced by Tekton. How does this work? Well, it's, pretty, it's actually pretty simple. It's actually described completely by this YAML on the right-hand side, but let me walk you through it first. What we want to do is we want to replace the user's command with our own command that, that forks the user's command as a subprocess. And the way that we do that is we'll have an init container, and both the init container and the main container will share an empty directory volume, and the init container will just copy that binary onto that volume, and then that's made available to us in the main container. So, so we, they don't need to be baked into the image of the container. This is, I mean, this is really handy. Actually, just loads of things that are really useful for us. So it allows us to do that ordered um, startup because the, the entry point, our new command, can wait for some condition before the subprocess is started. Um, that we can use that as a way to signal the subprocess, so to send sig terms and sig kills when we want to send them to it. Um, we can actually capture the subprocesses standard in and standard out and, and exit code, and you can actually do things like remap the exit code to a different exit code if you want to. Um, we can also wait for a condition before shutdown, which is pretty neat for debugging, so the, the user's main process can finish, that subprocess finishes, and then that container is held open, still running, while you can connect with kubexec to do some debugging. And the great thing is it that is very difficult with two containers in the pod is they can access the same file system. So you're, you can get access to any files on the user's file system because actually your process is running in, the, in, their, in their file system. As a couple of caveats, a couple of downsides. If you're gonna delay the start of that subprocess based on some condition, then that container is still gonna be running and it's gonna be consuming memory and it's gonna be costing you money as a result of that. Um, that'll be set by your resource requests. And typically, this kind of commandlet doesn't need very many resources at all. It can be pretty, pretty skinny, pretty lightweight. Um, but your main container maybe do some really heavy lifting and might have some high CPU memory GPU requirements. So that could be costly. Um, and you can mitigate that by um, working with resource requests. And the other thing it doesn't really allow us to do is we're still tied to pod spec, so we can't dynamically add containers to the graph. Originally, I titled this title just, just shut down, but it's really, shut down is SIG term, I think. So how can you ask a process to gracefully exit? Um, well, you need to do it with a SIG term, and there are two ways to send that signal today. One is to delete the pod, which is a pretty, um, it has the downsides that the pod is deleted, so you can't inspect the pod afterwards, can't look at its status afterwards once it's deleted, and you can't, you know, unless you've 
archive the logs, you, you lose access to the logs. And the other one is to use kubectl exec kill one. But I hope some people can realize the problems with that. So it's, I mean, it sounds like a great way to kill a pod, but it has three big drawbacks. Um, most pods don't have a kill binary on them. They might be a scratch or distroless images because you know, security is more important now, I think, for many people than a year ago. And so those images are much more common. Or it could be something like Debian where the kill isn't a binary, it's, it's a built-in, shell built-in. Um, it doesn't necessarily work with shell scripts particularly well. It can be hard to kill a shell script and have it gracefully shut down. And finally, if you're running this non-root, uh, your root process won't be started with PID number one. So kill one, uh, I mean, won't do anything at all in those containers. I think it will turn an exit code. Um, then, so here are a couple of mitigations for that. One is to use um, Dominit. So there are, I think there are two or three implementations of this. The one I know is, of, is by Yelp. And that um, provides an init process which handles those sig terms correctly. And that can fix your shell script forking and get those guys to shut down correctly. Um, like we did for the entry point, you can have your init container um, copy uh, a kill binary onto the, onto the image, onto that shared directory, and then you can actually just invoke that directory and you'll know the path for that. Um, and actually you can write kill in about 20 lines of Go. You can just write your own kill command. Well, and to mitigate the, the PID1 issue, you can use the PID of command to figure out which PID to do it. And there are various other ways to do that. Now, I can't talk about this with just saying, if you want to find out more about this, Jason and uh, Christy Wilson spoke about this in depth at KubeCon 2019, which feels like a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a link there in the slides if you want to find out in like a load more depth about it. It's hard to talk about writing your own controller and creating pods, I think, without talking a little bit about sidecars. So a little bit of revision for anybody who doesn't know what a sidecar is. A sidecar is just a container that runs next to your main container, provides some kind of facility. It's usually some kind of cross-cutting concern. Uh, this is an example, and it's straight out of the Kubernetes documentation, and it, it you know, shows a, a log collection sidecar. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, the, the problems with sidecars is uh, we don't uh, control them, and they can become quite unruly. You know, we don't know how they behave. We don't know if they're going to um, accept SIG term correctly and, and, and run it. We don't even know if they have an init process. So they're a bit of a black box to us. And it gets kind of even worse when we talk about injected sidecars, like uh, those that come with Istio and Vault. Um, so an injected sidecar is um, a term we use to describe a, a a container that's added to the pod spec after creation by a mutating webhook controller. And because it's added by that mutating webhook controller, we just don't, we don't have any information about it. We can't intercept it or change it. We can't rewrite the entry point. Now, Istio does provide a quick, quick, quick endpoint. I think that's how you pronounce it, quick, quick, quick. Uh, but it's not really a standard. And our solution today, certainly for workflows, is if people have Istio or Vault running, we say, well, uh, disable it, and, and that's a shame because people want to use those technologies for really good reasons, and we'd really love to be able to support them doing that. Container IPC, or if I've termed it, CIPC, which again I made up last Wednesday. It's a big day. It's a big day. It's a productive day of making up <laughs> new terms. Uh, so why would we want to do container IPC, and what's our use cases for it? Well, it's about particularly about sharing data between two containers. So for example, um, you want to download a file from S3 or some other kind of bucket storage and make it available for that main container. Or you might want to do some kind of remote procedure calls between the two containers. Or you might want to do some kind of streaming data, you know, get messages from Kafka and provide those to the main container amongst you know, quite a few different use cases, I would say. Now, container IPC is just, it's just Nick's IPC. And there are about five to seven to nine different ways of doing Nix IPC. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them that we've found that work really well with uh, our systems. The first one that both Argo and Tekton use is this ubiquitous shared empty volume. Alex, what, how do I solve this problem? Well, I think it's probably solved by a shared empty directory. <laughs> uh, but any Argo workflows users know that it's not too far from the truth. Uh, so it, it, the shared empty directory allows you to uh, communicate between two uh, processes, typically using some kind of marker file. So one of the two processes will write a marker file into that directory, and the other process will let sit there polling for changes to that file. And when that file has changed, it kind of reads the contents and performs some kind of option. 
Um, obviously, on a shared empty directory, you can, uh, you, you can mount a FIFO using MK FIFO, um, or um, you know, whatever your language's FIFO creation API is. Uh, and that's quite, quite fast if you want to just do read and write of um, bytes, but it's, it's not particularly proven. If you look out there, there's not too much documentation on that. Um, but the nice thing about shared empty directory volumes is that they're really simple. I mean, just so simple, they're super secure, and they're really robust. So they're great for, for what I would call slow IPC, where, where that, you don't have a lot of data going through, and those messages don't change a lot. But if you want something faster, then there's another really great tool in the toolkit to use, and that's just HTTP. Um, HTTP has these great benefits of being well-known and easy to implement. Most programming languages come with HTTP server and HTTP client built into them, so you don't have to worry about checking your dependency tree for those you know, problematic security issues. It's just part of the, of the core SDK. Um, you need to define an API contract. It's you know, not particularly difficult. Um, the nice thing about uh, this is it's actually relatively secure. You actually don't need HTTPS between two containers within a pod um, because they have their own network namespace. You can just use HTTP. And it's actually pretty fast. It's pretty fast, um, especially if you are using HTTP keep alive, so the socket, you don't have the socket establishment cost, and you're using Unix domain sockets as well. You can get a pretty nice um, performance and throughput benefit from using those. And um, well, when we rehearsed this earlier on, I was telling Jason how Java 16 now supports Unix domain sockets. And it turns out I should have also been talking about Java 17, but that's out <laughs> recently as well. So yeah, well, yeah widely supported Unix domain sockets. And this is great for fast IPC, if you've got a lot of throughput. Now, are there other ways of doing container IPC? So these are some of the examples of the kind of TPS messages per second you can get with some of the other technologies out there. Um, so things like pipes, message queues, POSIX, and SysV message queues, um, shared memory and memory map files. And if you, if you just take a look at this graph, you can see that the throughput um, you can get uh, from memory map files is, you know, what is that, of 20 times? 20 times faster. So there's like a, there are other ways much, much faster than TCP, but these are kind of unproven, and, and in the kind of research that I've done on this topic, it has been a bit here be dragons on the internet, and I'd love to hear from anybody who has looked at memory map files between containers. I'd be fascinated to know what their results were. Back to my colleague, Jason. Thank you. Um, so, like with containers, we also need to pass data from one pod to another pod um, efficiently. Uh, for example, uh, the canonical use cases for this are if a task uh, does a git clone of some revision of some repository, it might need to pass the commit that was actually checked out to the next task in the pipeline. Or if it built a, de built a container image, it would need to pass the digest to the next task that signs it or scans it or does something else with it. Um, we also need to expose that information up to the user that's looking through uh, the API or the UI or CLI. Um, and these are all short-lived containers that we don't necessarily control. So we don't have a lot of options for having users request HTTP endpoints directly on those containers to get that information. And so uh, in Tecton, at least, we've uh, found a fun little workaround using a little-known technology called termination messages. Um, not a lot of people know about this, or I don't think they do, um, but if you write to this magical path in your container, slash dev, slash termination, dash log, by default, it will magically get collected by the kubelet and uh, written up to the pod status for that container. Um, so this is a little way to, to ferry information out of your pod, uh, out of your container, through the pod, up to the API server. Um, and it's configurable with the, the container's termination message path. Um, so yeah, the more you know. So the way that Tecton uses this is um, if a container, if a step container writes to slash Tecton slash results slash something, the injected entry point that Alex talked about before will, after the step is complete, it will scan all of Tecton results and see if there's anything in there. It will collect that information. It will stuff it into a JSON string and write it to its termination message path um, that gets collected by Kubelet, written up to the API server, the controller watching that pod uh, pulls out that JSON and then puts it into the task run status where, where it goes. Um, and this lets us uh, pass that data on to other tasks and show it to end users. Um, we also use this to report the actual start time for the containers. So like Alex said, 
all the containers start at once, and then only the first subprocess starts, and then only the second step subprocess starts when that's done. Um, so we lose the actual start time of each of these containers, but we uh, write it to the termination message path as well. So there are some limits with this, though, that we have uh, started to hit, and that's that uh, the kubelet will only write, will only collect 4K of data to pass up per container, and only 12K of data across all the containers in the pod. Um, this is mostly enough to get the job done if we're talking about, you know, git commit SHAs and uh, container image digests and timestamps and, and relatively small bits of information. But it will start to break down if you do anything more crazy than that. And it's really only a matter of time before people come and ask if they can do something more crazy than that. Um, to poorly paraphrase Steve Jobs, 4K should be enough for anybody uh, is not uh, actually true, as it turns out. And we've, we've talked about compressing this data, compressing the data better than JSON or encoding it in something better than JSON, but ultimately, if the 4K limit is there, you're gonna hit it uh, one way or another uh, eventually. So something we started to look into is um, instead of writing to that termination message uh, path, we will have the injected entry point contact the API server and write to a config map. Um, the config map max size is much, much larger than 12K. Um, and so for every task run that we'll run, we'll create a config map to hold its results. The entry point will write that data to, to the config map. And we can tightly, narrowly scope the RBAC to that results object to, um, so that the entry point is only allowed to write to it and the controller is the only one allowed to read from it so you can't have cross-task uh, contamination in the results. And that's basically exactly what Argo Workflows does. Um, so uh, it's nice to have proof that that works. There are, however, some disadvantages. Um, if we want to use config maps, we can use config maps. Uh, if we wanted to use our own type that we define, we now have to define that type and manage that type and version and upgrade and, and validate that type. Um, and the sort of bigger concern is the additional load on the API server. So instead of uh, just writing to the pod that we already use and update all the time, we're also making frequent writes to this, uh, to this config map or another custom resource. And we have to create RBAC for that on every new task and every new execution and manage it and delete things when they're done so they don't leak and it's, it, it, can get, um, it can get difficult. That also leads me to my next uh, issue uh, that we have started to hit, which is custom resource proliferation. Uh, as I said before, custom resources are great. Tekton wouldn't exist without it. Argo wouldn't exist without it. Plenty of other things in the ecosystem would not exist if Kubernetes didn't provide an extensible uh, API server. But fundamentally, they're not magic. Uh, at the end of the day, CRDs are just writing to etcd. And etcd, while also really great, is not magic. It's not the key to unlocking uh, free, infinite, scalable storage. Um, and if you try, uh, like some people do, you will hit limits. And when you hit those limits, uh, you will experience pain. You will start to experience pain in a few dimensions. Uh, one way you can mess up at CD is to write too many bytes. Like I said, it's not an infinite storage. You will eventually hit some limit, and at CD will start to fall over. If you create a lot of tiny objects, too many tiny objects, however many bytes total it is, doesn't matter, too many objects, etcd will start to fall over. And if you're just constantly writing requests to etcd through the API server and constantly updating, um, etcd won't like it and will fall over. Um, destabilizing etcd is really, really, really bad. Uh, the cluster just store, sort of starts to act funny and things don't work and requests start to time out. And What's, starts to beep. Yeah, pagers, pagers go off and you get angry calls from SREs. And um, uh, the worst thing is that you can't debug it because you're using the system that's destabilized to debug it. Uh, and so everything just sort of turns to, to mush underneath you and it's, and it's awful. Um, we, have some, we have discovered some mitigations for this. Um, one really easy one is don't use jobs when you really just want pods. Uh, if you create a job, it will just create a pod for you, and now you've created double the resources and double the QPS, because when the pod updates, it'll update the job, and then you read the job. Um, so that was an easy one. That's like 50% off right there. Um, avoid unnecessary updates to your objects, if you can, in your reconcile loop, instead of making you know 10 requests to update the status of something, uh, batch those until the end and make one update at the end. 
avoid duplicating the same information across a bunch of objects. So Tecton actually doesn't do this well today. Uh, when a task run, um, uh, a task run status is actually copied and aggregated into the pipeline run status uh, for ease of the user, but that means that we have to make two updates every time anything changes. Um, also avoid these monolithic mega objects like the pipeline run um, because you will update them more often and they start to hit those size limits that we talked about. Uh, at the same time, avoid lots and lots of little objects because you will also uh, end up making a bunch of QPS uh, uh, to the API server and uh, you'll end up with maybe too many objects for etcd to be happy. Um, Argo actually has a really interesting uh, feature that I didn't know about until earlier, until we were working on this talk, uh, which is that if the status of an Argo object gets too big, it will, the controller will offload it to another database and just give it a pointer to that. Give it, so instead of your status, you just say like, go chase this pointer to the real database to go uh, get that information. So that's um, really interesting. Other mitigations we've had for, for custom resource proliferation are just enforce or resource quota. Uh, in a namespace, you can say this namespace is not allowed to have more than a thousand task runs ever. And if you try to create a thousand and first, it will fail. Um, you might also want to prune old resources. We do this uh, in Tecton a lot today. But the question there is always like, do you want to prune by age? Do you want to say something, I only want to keep the last week of history, or do you want to prune by number of resources? I only want to keep the last 10,000 uh, requests, whether or not, uh, however old they are. But fundamentally, users don't want to lose this data, especially um, if it's security sensitive, like what did we deploy three months ago um, well, sorry, we needed that space, so we deleted all record of that deployment ever happening is not uh, a good answer for users. So um, Tecton and Argo have also solved this in a similar way or are planning to solve it in a similar way. Um, in Tecton, we have a Tecton results project, and in Argo, they have Argo Workflow Archive, which uh, effectively runs another controller to watch for these executions. Um, when they uh, finish, it copies that data to another uh, uh, relational database and then prunes that object from uh, the Kubernetes API server. This also gives us an opportunity to have better indexing and searching, and you can search for failed task runs that took more than 30 minutes in the last 20 days, which is not something, as far as I know, you can do with the Kubernetes uh, field selector today. Um, but unfortunately, this means like we lose all of the, uh, some of the nice ecosystem stuff of like kube control doesn't work, and uh, uh, all of these things need to be sort of custom built to support that. Alex? So, are we going to do this? Yeah, okay, we do we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Okay. We'll do it. What, so, what, what can we do about this? Well, we could do nothing. This is my first option. I always present everybody in my organization. What does doing nothing mean? Just keep hacking around it. Yeah, we just keep working around it. Um, it's kind of value add for both Tecton and Argo. You know, because Kubernetes doesn't support this out of the box, we get to add that value to it. And if it was um, supported, we wouldn't get to that. But we could do caps. <laughs> that was the thing. We enjoyed that. that was I, fun. I did. You didn't. Okay, we won't do it again. <laughs> we'll never do that again. Um, so what, it would be great to kind of add some additional features to Kubernetes. So one of the things would be an API to start and stop containers. That would be fantastic, like a container sub-resource or something along those sort of lines where you can say stop the container, start the container, don't start this container just yet. Um, it would be nice to be able to declare the DAG as a, a, a dependency tree with inside the container spec. So say container two is dependent on container one. We could have that. That would be pretty neat. Um, we talked a bit about standardizing the commandlet pattern, so maybe providing a library that people could use that is kind of well tested and robust that you could just use that, and that commandlet would expose some kind of API that people could use that would allow you to use kubectl exec or um, curl to just invoke commands on it and it would deal with it for you. Um, and for resource quotas, so people use resource quotas to limit the number of um, custom resources you know, in a namespace, typically used for limiting the number of pods, but you can lose it for custom resources. But it'd be nice if in that we could specify what to do when there are too many. You know, um, Some kind of strategy saying, for example, delete the oldest one of these custom resources and kind of clean up afterwards. I think that would be pretty neat. Um, I guess we freestyle a lot of these ideas, don't we? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think it's kind of like an interesting space to kind of think around in it. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, so the question was, given the, uh, a common use case for Tekton at least is clone some source from a repo uh, and then build it, run tests, do other stuff, scan it, do, you know, let's say five other things uh, in parallel. Um, currently today, we, uh, we would ask you to make a PVC to have one task, write, uh, write that data to a PVC and then share that PVC read only to the other ones. Um, there's some... And obviously there are downsides to that of now you have this PVC you have to clean up or at least have around. Um, and it can limit your schedule ability of those things. Um, there's some interesting work going on in being able to run all of a pipeline in one pod. So effectively that would, you would have one big pod that does all the resources of all of those things and they would run in one shared on, on the same node. Um, but uh, in that way you wouldn't have to write the persistent data outside of the execution of that pod. There's, um, if you find me afterwards, I will uh, send you a link to the actual uh, proposal for that. But I think that's a, an exciting sort of area of frontier of uh, solving that problem. Yeah, so, so you can also do the, the sorry, the follow-up was um, uh, instead of using PVCs, could you write to some external object store, S3, GCS, uh, whatever? Um, absolutely, that's, that's absolutely an option. Um, it has more or less all the same problems as PVCs. You have to write this data somewhere and it costs money while it sits there and costs money to delete it and it costs money to, or, you know, it's, it's management overhead. Um, I really think the the fundamental problem is you don't want that data to exist longer than it's being operated on. And in that case, if it just was isolated to the pod, it would you know, disappear when the pod disappears. So a, co a coder to this is that we actually do something like this in uh, Argo. You can share data between the steps in your, in your workflow by using S3. Um, and it's sometimes cheaper than PVCs and sometimes faster and sometimes more expensive. Kind of depends on what your use case is. OK, next question. OK, so the, the question was, did you look at Kubernetes events as a way to um, message between pods? I'm going to say no from Argo's side. I don't think we did. I mean, it has all of the same API server scalability problems, right? Like, if that's, if, if that's your message bus, if the way you communicate between containers in a pod or pods in a workflow, um, it, it's sort of a, you might be able to get by with it, but it's, it's going to going to be plagued by all the problems we've described here, which is it's not built for this, it's not designed for that scale. Um, so maybe, like by all means, we can experiment and see what what falls over. But I don't know if uh, I don't know if it's better than what we have today. Okay. Any questions from the from the middle, from the back, the middle? So, so the question was, um, with Vault and Istio, um, is, is there an alternative for Vault by using the CSI injector ahead of time? Yeah, 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 you could, you could do that. It's the fact that we, they use a mutating webhook that, that, that makes them difficult to work with. And specifically to inject new containers that we don't know about. Yeah, Like, yeah, if they were injecting other stuff, you know, whatever, I don't yeah, care. But, volumes would be fine, yeah. Yeah. Other, other methods that are being used. 
what happens when those clouds just get shot in our head? It's just in an error condition, but it's a, a normal part of living in Kubernetes culture. So that just kind of like put a monkey in the room. How do you handle that? So I'll take this one. Sure. So the, quest, the question was, uh, you'll understand why I'm laughing in a second, is um, when, when you're running a, a DAG and you have a, a container and it gets, um, I believe you said, shot in the head. Okay, uh, terminated. <laughs> terminated, terminated because gracelessly. Kubernetes might want the resources. And the, I feel like the one contractual promise Kubernetes gives you is, I will kill your pod. At some point, <laughs> I'm going to kill your pod when you don't want it. And it's a really hard problem to solve. Um, because we're trying to run really reliable, robust workloads on Kubernetes, and those two things are a diametric opposition. Yeah, they are, they are fighting against one another, and there are kind of mitigating actions you can take, like a pod disruption budget, for example. Um, in workflows, the main thing we do is allow you to just retry those steps automatically, and things like retry them on a different node within your cluster, change, change where it gets rerun, that's the main thing that we do. Um, and the good thing to do, and I don't know if it's the case for Tekton, is, is, is is don't have very long-running processes which take an hour to run, cost an absolute fortune, and if they get 55 minutes into that being terminated gracefully, um, <laughs> the, you have to do all that work again, because that can happen over again. It's better to have some kind of memoization going on in the process. Yeah. Do pre-stop hooks help? Uh, so the question is, do pre-stop hooks help? We don't use them, but yes, I think they can, yes. I mean, fundamental. So, so this is points to another like way in which Kubernetes was not designed for this. Kubernetes is designed for replicated serving workloads, where if somebody unplugs a node, it should be fine, right? We very much need that pod to finish for the next one to start and things to work. So, it's sort of a, a difference of assumptions between what Kubernetes assumes and what we assume. Um, yeah. Do we have? Sorry. She's giving a thumbs up. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? All right. So just one more thing. If you want to find out more, um, oh, has the size gone a bit strange on this? Yes, it has, never mind. <laughs> um, I don't know why that text is so small. You can, I'm at the uh, Intuit booth today. We're in Zone Sage. I'll be on the booth from 3.30 if you want to talk about Argo kind of related stuff. Or you can obviously go to the Argo booth to speak to some of the engineers there as well. Um, will you be on the Red Hat booth? I'll be around, yeah. So that's right. where you can find out more. See you out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.